Welcome to Revolution Against Evolution. I'm your host, Doug Sharp. Your co-host, Rich Gear here as well. And we have a wonderful guest here, Mr. Deer from Belgium, although he's real, you're really here from the States. And uh, Kirby Riles, welcome to the show. Merci beaucoup. C'est un plaisir avec d'être avec vous tous. J'ai oublié comment on parle français ce soir, malheureusement. Easy for him to say. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what did you actually say then? <laughs> French, obviously, I, from Belgium. I, I said I'm getting rusty. I've been here a week and I'm forgetting my French already. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Kirby, you've been you've been you were in Russia for many years and you've been in Belgium. Well, how long were you in both places? I'm trying to think. Oh, 14 years in Russia and seven in Belgium. Yeah. So you've been out down the field for 21 years then. Yeah. I remember when you first left because you used to work. You used to work for the state of Michigan one time, yes. a long time ago. Yeah. So we're glad to have you here. It's great. Man. Oh, Thanks for having me. And him in town. So anyway, um, Doug, what do you want to talk about? How do we want to grill this guy? No, not really. We're not going to do that. Well, obviously, <laughs> uh, if you're a missionary, you're uh, dealing with uh, uh, some of the unbelief that uh, takes place in, in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what is happening in Europe and how the spiritual life is uh, happening uh, in your area and uh, uh, all over the European continent and what is really going on? Well, I was just, we were talking beforehand that I'd like to see both of you come over to help us and uh, I think that can work out quite easily. Um, and one of the things I mentioned was that we'd like to have a visit to the Centre de Laïcité, which is like an atheist church. They have them all over Belgium. And the one that's closest to us is 30 minutes away in Arlon. It's like a, it's just a place where atheists get together. They do their own funerals. They do their own weddings. They have their own get together. It's like church without God. And I find it very funny. Um, atheists can be kind of cranky over there. Um, sometimes they're aggressive and, and angry. Uh, I think that's very often because they've seen some bad things maybe from their upbringing in the church. Um, some of them are just blasé, they don't have any real reason for their atheism. Um, and some of them are quite funny. I'll tell you one story and then I'll you guys, let you ask some questions, but about oh, a couple of months ago I ran across a friend of mine, uh, they were Russians, we heard them speaking Russian. So since we still speak Russian, we chatted with them and they invited us over for tea. Russians love to drink tea. So we went over there and we're drinking tea and the grandmother, who's about 60, from Belarus, she asked me what we're doing. I said, well, we're missionaries. We're here starting a church. And she started laughing. She thought it was just hilarious that I believed in God. And she just went quite a while with that. And it was so bad, her daughter said, Mother, you shouldn't be mocking other people's faith. And she just thought it was hilarious <laughs> that we believed in God. Okay, two weeks later, they're at our house for tea. I didn't, didn't bother me at all, the, the laughing. Uh, and we invited them over for tea. So they're there. And the grandmother, Golly is her name, is feeling, looking down. And I said, Golly, what, what's wrong? And she said, oh. Uh, I don't have a visa to be in Belgium. I need medical treatment in the Belgian hospitals and the Belgian government says I'm il here illegally and they're going to kick me out of the country in 10 days. Mm. So I said, would you like me to pray for you? Now remember, two weeks <laughs> earlier, God had been a big joke. Well tonight, I said, when I said, would you like me to pray for you? She said, please. Please. Was this the one who was laughing or was it the daughter? The very same one. Okay, very same, the very one. same one. It was two weeks ago, it's a big joke tonight, and the Russian word for it is Pajalista. You just, there's such emotion in it. That's why she said Pajalista. So I prayed for her right there. Mm -hmm. And a little time went by, a couple weeks, and they gave her an, extended, an extension. Wow. With no, with no limit. So, so much for atheism. Now, atheism is, is skin deep. Someone once said it's a, it's a mile wide and an inch deep. It's not profound. People are not really atheists. I like to say they don't exist. Atheists don't exist. Whatever. That's my theory because I've never met one. When you really talk to them like this lady, they eventually say, yeah, I, I do pray. Usually it's because of some hurt or some perceived uh, a slight or, you know, it, it, I, we, we were talking about this earlier before the show, but like, they're, they're really, a lot of the atheists or the secularists here in this country, mm -hmm. they're so hostile against something that doesn't exist. And it sort of doesn't really make a lot of sense when you think about it. Why would they be so hostile to, well, they're hostile to creation, they're hostile to God, Jesus Christ, you know, they're really hostile 
But I go, well, he's a myth. Well, Jesus really may be walking the planet. You may accept that. Mm -hmm. If he was God, you're never going to accept that. that. That's all just a myth. Well, why, why do you care? You know, why is it such a big deal? I mean, I don't... Nobody really cares if something's really false unless people are being dragged into bad... Uh, you know, you're killing people or hurting people or, 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 or destroying whatever it is. But Christianity does things like love your brother, you know, treat your neighbor as yourself... Uh, be faithful, you know, I mean, we don't always succeed in, but that's not because of Christianity, that's because we're human beings and we fail. Yeah. That's a whole different world there. But what mm -hmm. we preach, what we want to have is a much different thing. So I've always found that a little bit uh, remarkable um, and maybe what used to observe observation, the, the skin deep, is because ultimately they know there's really not much substance below that because what, like you were talking about this one this atheist church of the city or whatever, yeah. or what, what, it's like but the point of it is, is what's the point? Why even, you know, if you're worm food in 50 years or 20 years, or what does it matter, you know? Eh, throw me in, throw me through in the alley, and I'm just, I'm done, you know? There's, yeah. there's nothing else. Um, but I think you, you're right. They suspect there's something more than that. Which was harder, uh, a harder place to, um, to do mission work? Was it Russia or Belgium or is it about the same? Well, each one had its own particular thing. Uh, in Russia, the people were more open the government was more difficult. Really? Okay. In Belgium, mm -hmm. it's, it's the other way around. The people are more closed, and the government's more open. So we have religious freedom to a definite degree in Belgium, okay. more so than we do in Russia. Um, but one thing I did note, and you asked about the difference between Europe and the United States, is uh, creationism, intelligent design, is viewed by most Europeans, anyone that's educated, as totally a crackpot idea. They don't even begin to consider it as a possible theory. Whereas in the United States, most of the population believe that God created the world. We're talking about the population, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would say the intelligentsia still thinks it's a crackpot, crackpot idea. Right. You go into the, you know, you know, we talk about Richard Dawkins and many of the other notable notables in the evolutionary or secularist field. And, and, but most of the time we found out it's a lot of ad hominem arguments. There's really not a lot of substance to their mm -hmm. arguments. As I told you, we went to see Richard Dawkins here in Michigan State a few years back, and a bunch of the, bunch of kids went. They were kind of really intimidated because he's the big shot, and he spent really most of the lecture in this atheist club trying to do, trying to defend why a bird's wing is not designed the way an airplane wing is designed. <laughs> I go, man, the complexity of one compared to the other is not even remotely close. <laughs> and, and and the guys, I mean, that was a, that was nothing. Yeah, the bird's wing is far more complicated yeah. than an air, aircraft. And the point of it is, is that, is, is that it was good to say the kids went out there and saw what, quote, the most brilliant evolutionist in the world is all about, and they weren't that really impressed, okay? Now, granted, it's a lecture, and, you know, maybe not, didn't have his best stuff, but, I mean, that seemed to be a, that was a big idea. That was, what was that, a couple of years ago? That was a big yeah, thing that, a couple of years yeah, ago when he, was, when he was trying to promote all that idea, and, we went and saw it. You weren't able to go as every No, I, I yeah. didn't make it. Uh, yeah. I was doing something else. But uh, you, know, you know what? I'm, I'm doomed here. I've got you and I've got Kirby. How am I going to get a word in That's right. This is bad. I tried to open it up so you could get a word in We're trying to be yeah. nice. We're trying. We're trying. Hey, you know? He just lobbed you a softball <laughs> question there. He just lobbed you a softball <laughs> That's right, man. Take it away, Doc. <laughs> And uh, now that I am speaking, I'm about coughing my head <laughs> off. <laughs> uh, but the thing that I, I see is uh, that uh, there, is, there are so many benefits to uh, having Christian faith. And uh, a lot of people don't understand what those benefits are. And uh, we as Christians uh, experience love. We have, have peace and, uh, in our hearts. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, because God uh, has control of, over this world, He ha has promised that in His wor world. Although, you know, sometimes it doesn't look like that. But we, uh, experiencing a relationship with God, uh, we can understand that uh, the world can be going all to pieces, and then instead. You know, we uh, have peace within us because uh, we, we know that Jesus uh, has entered our, into our, our lives and in our hearts, and uh, He's given us, uh, you know, this. We know, it's just something you know. Uh, well, I think there's a thing too, Doug. Don't you think that, and that curve you I mean, a human being that does not exercise faith is really not a complete human being. There are certain things, I think, inside of us programmed that we need to exercise 
those kinds of things to make us complete. Just like love is another part, another component. Mm -hmm. These are all godly virtues. In fact, in the, in the, in the scriptures, it tells you there's three things that are going to remain forever. Faith, hope, and love. Everything else is going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. Okay, but those three things, and we can enter into faith, and we can enter into love, and we can enter into hope. We have a hope, because I, I, we were talking earlier, you know, the atheists, I go, what's the point? You are without hope, because, I mean, that, if, I mean, if you think when you die and that's all there is, then why are you spending all this time doing all this for of activity mm -hmm. for something that's really going to be pointless in 50 years or 100 mm -hmm. years? No one's going to care. You might be history lesson if you're lucky. And even that, you're generally a boring history lesson. Right. Nobody even cares. But I'm saying, outside of that, what, what is your meaning? And, and, uh, and some people, I, I guess they delude themselves to thinking, well, that's okay, I don't need any meaning. I, I, that's the only way I can... It's a nihilistic, mm -hmm. you know, um, basically postmodern way of thinking in a way that well, I've I, never seen I, it quite as evident as it is in recent, in recent years. I, I think some people get their meaning now, I'd like to ask you about this, Doug. Is it seems to me Richard Dawkins has a purpose and meaning to his life. He's on a crusade, mm -hmm. a religious crusade, to wipe out religion because right. he sees it as a curse on society. Uh, and yet, we were talking before the uh, the taping tonight that Richard Dawkins has a motive that's pushing him, making him anti-Christian. And you'd mentioned what that was. Well, uh, I understand that you know he grew up in Africa uh, with uh, his parents being missionaries, and I, I'd like to uh, someday ask him if I had a chance to talk with the uh, Dawkins. I'd ask him about about this uh, particular event in his life. What was it that uh, your you saw in Africa that uh, uh, that you thought was hypocritical or? Uh, or a, a little bit out of line of what you thought uh, Christianity mm -hmm. should be, and why is it then that you uh, taken up a crusade to hate God? You know, and it's and we are. I admit that we are extrapolating <coughs> a little bit here because we don't know. I mean, he's likely to say, "Well, I just figured it out." Mm -hmm. You know, there are people mm -hmm. that do that, but I, you know, figuring it out is really not quite the same thing as. It, it, mm -hmm. Usually, we found out people who have a real uh, anti antipathy towards Christianity. And faith usually have had been burned or had an experience that right. soured them on faith. They saw us when we act, when we played the hypocrite or we didn't do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Or they saw something, maybe they prayed for something and God let them down. That's a big thing a lot of yeah. times. I, or they were betrayed by somebody who was a Christian. There's usually a personal reason. It's very, very rare. In fact, I can't ever remember if I've ever heard of it. Somebody actually, quote, figures it out. It's usually mm -hmm. they have some emotional thing that they, I mean, especially when you have something, the hatred the dock it seems to have, it really seems to be a, a vendetta, yeah. which is different. You well, know? There, there's, always you know? a, there's, a, there's always a test. You know, so like, uh, like Job went through a test. And uh, I think uh, every person experienced this thing where his, their faith uh, is tested, and either they pass or they fail. Uh, doesn't mean that uh, eventually they don't get another chance at uh, at uh, exercising their faith, but you know unless there's a, a test, there's no testimony, and uh, that's the the whole uh, issue is that uh, you the, we are here for one purpose and one purpose only, and that's to make this decision: Are we going to follow God? Or are we going to follow our own way? So trust in God or trust in ourselves? You know, I, I think logic can be very deceptive. People think mm -hmm. they've got logical atheism right. and that they think it's all scientific. And the irony is it's not at all scientific. Mm -hmm. uh, atheistic evolution is not scientific. It's, it's bad science, as we all know. Mm -hmm. um, there's always a motive. There's something that, that twists them and pushes them. Um, I think for a little child, could logically make the case that his parents are evil. I want mm -hmm. to eat candy all the time, they force me to eat vegetables, they are mm -hmm. evil. I want to stay up all night, they force me to go to bed, they are evil. I want to stay home and watch cartoons, they force me to go to school where there's a mean teacher. My parents are evil, they hate me. Logically that makes perfect sense, but we all know there's mm -hmm. a higher logic that child doesn't understand, his teeth are going to rot out. And his brain's going to turn to mush <laughs> if, if he follows his logic. Yeah. But, you know, in the same way with us, we're not in a position to judge God. That we, he's given us plenty of things to see that he's a good God, but we can easily slip into something where we judge God. We put ourselves 
in a higher position and find God guilty. Well, don't you think also we have the, the fall of nature of Adam and Eve who wanted to be God apart from God in us as well? I think there's that part of it that, that mm -hmm. allowed, they wanted, we wanted to usurp his place. We want to call the shots ourselves many times. And I think sometimes you people, the, it's like when, you, when you've blown it, let's say, you find, you find reasons to even blow it even more. You feel like, okay, I'm, I'm too rotten to do anything. I might as well just go ahead and go all the way. Mm -hmm. And I, I see this a lot of times in people that go, all right, I'm, or I'm, going to call, I'm, I'm going to call the shots. I want to be, I want to be God without God. And I see this a lot in some of these people. They think that they, uh, I'm autonomous. I don't need God. I got my bank account. I, got this. I said, you're going to die. You're going to die. And then what have you? You know, mm -hmm. you have nothing. And uh, those are the things that, that, uh, that uh, I tell people, if I'm totally deluded, mm -hmm. I have hope in this, in this, that there's something beyond and greater. I, I, I believe absolutely I'm not deluded. I think there's, like you say, there, there is reasons for faith. There's tremendous reasons. It's not, it's not blind faith. Mm -hmm. But despite all that, if I'm told, I have a hope that you can never have being an atheist. You can never have it. You are walking this life, and in 100 years you're warm food. And that's mm -hmm. all you've got. You have nothing else. And I'm telling you, the, the, the point of it, you're talking about that place down there having funerals. And, yeah. and what the heck is all that about? <laughs> okay, it makes, you know, I, and we grant you, a lot of times funerals are for the living. I'll grant you that. Mm -hmm. What good does do the dead person? Yeah. The dead person's not, not you know, there's, there's no... Can you imagine an atheist funeral? <laughs> that doesn't, yeah, I, I, I doesn't I make know, it doesn't sense. make a lot of sense to me. But within a certain milieu, it's amazing how we can do things, Doug. And Kurt, we can do <coughs> We just we can get ourselves so myopically centered on the thing we're doing that we mm -hmm. fail to understand it really what is the big bigger point of it you know I think it, it's, that's, go ahead. that's really it's the bigger point because um, evolution it seems to me correct me if I'm wrong is just a symptom of the atheistic worldview mm -hmm. they're yeah, looking I for agree. something to justify it and they think they found it in evolution which is ironic because there's a bigger question it seems to me and I'd like to throw this but you dug another softball, mm -hmm. and that would be get a word in edgewise. Mm -hmm. Get a word in edgewise. Two words in abiogenesis. Uh, there, yep. Richard Dawkins has actually said he doesn't know how life began. He's That's actually right, yeah. speculated uh, that maybe by space aliens. So before we can get into evolution, you have to have life to evolve. Is is that the is that the Achilles heel of of evolutionary? Theory? Well, it certainly is. Uh, but, you know, I. Uh, I, I tried doing the test tube experiments uh, to create life in the test tube, and um, it, it uh, just doesn't get all of the get uh, get beyond the first two amino acids. You know, you have uh, the chemistry working against them joining to form uh, even a dimer, let alone a, a something meaningful in a 400 to 500 uh, uh, amino acid sequence, and so. Uh, to actually uh, try to say that you can create life in a test tube, well, uh, it, it takes um, uh, chemists, months of planning and uh, a sophisticated uh, automated equipment in order to get, you know, they can synthesize some proteins, but they have to uh, come up with uh, all left-handed amino acids in order to do that, and they have to get that from life. Uh, so the, 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 because it's impossible to purify it, to, uh, you know, when you create it in the uh, laboratory. So it, it's just uh, uh, not possible to even consider chemical evolution. Uh, uh, and once you uh, create a protein, well, the trouble is you have to get all these other proteins in together in the DNA uh, to work with it in order to, for it to come into a manufacturing process. And this and we know what it's supposed to look like. Right, yeah. We, we know what it's supposed to look like to start with, we can't do it. You well, know? Uh, the, the, the guy who discovered the double helix of DNA won a Nobel Prize mm -hmm. because it was so spectacularly complicated, and yet he was just discovering what already exists. Mm -hmm. If he got a prize for just discovering what already existed, how much more profound knowledge is required to create such a DNA chain? Mm -hmm. so, well, Doug has often said it's like a four-dimensional computer code. With no, with no uh, uh, d uh, artif or, uh, obsolete language. That's what's right, that's right, amazing. Yeah. What's amazing. And then we had Y2K, you know, 15 years ago, and everyone was terrified because we had a lot of the 
computer had basic and I wasn't really that worried about it. I don't think you weren't that too worried about it, were you, Doug? Or? No, I knew uh, two years going into it that uh, it was going to be a big nothing. Uh, but the point of it is we do have languages that are obsolete, Getting trying to get the computer mm -hmm. program. God, God didn't have any of it. The DNA was out of the box was good. There's no precursor data. They try to make you like this fake or earlier DNA that maybe RNA or mm -hmm. what's the, what are some of the ones they think maybe that builds into DNA. Or, none of it works. You, right. need, you need to have one to have the other. What is it, Doug? You, if you don't have proteins, you, you can't get you can't get the DNA. And, yeah, right. And if you don't have DNA, you can't get protein. I mean, or, yeah, and, the, the protein you need for DNA is uh, DNA polymerase. Yeah. And that's an interesting thing. It, uh, um, it sort of like goes around the DNA and there's a ring and it keeps it from twisting up, uh, 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 getting tangled up as it uh, mm -hmm. uh, assembles itself and uh, it's just an amazing uh, piece of uh, computer code. Uh, it's more than computer code, like I, I've often observed is that uh, the uh, chemistry by itself really isn't life. It's the spirit that surrounds it that uh, keeps it going together. So there's actually a, a, the spirit that causes it to function. You know, there's intelligence involved in it. Uh, and uh, because this uh, intelligence, which is the spiritual aspect, is what really uh, holds it all together. When, when that spirit leaves, it's dead, uh, and you're just a pile of chemicals. Nothing yeah. works, yeah. Well, we said, yeah, if energy was all you needed, put a dead frog in a microwave, maybe that'll help. You know, <laughs> you know try, try to re try un undo uh, roadkill. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Even you know, though you have 90% of the material, you have all the stuff right there. <clears throat> that's a little spark of life is missing. Mm -hmm. and, you know, speaking of, uh, I, I hope that some that are watching this are, are examining the, the roots of, of evolutionary theory, and, which is atheism. And uh, I'd like to tell one story. I've mentioned this maybe before, but years ago I, I was in a correspondence. I'd written an article which was published in the state news, uh, basically noting the impossibility of life creating itself. And even the, uh, the ability, inability of us to copy life. You, 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 cl without, I'm not talking about cloning, which uses processes that which we did not develop and, and biological material which we did not create to copy another. But to create something from nothing or, or to manufacture a living cell, it's impossible. I, I, I got a response from a gentleman in California who was, uh, said he was a pure atheist and was intrigued by my article. And uh, so we started a correspondence for like eight months. Wow. Every, every two, three days there was another email going back and forth. Mm -hmm. And a very bright guy. And um, finally one day I said to him, his name is Issy, I said, Issy, have you ever prayed in your life? He said, yes. Well, this is the first intimation I'd had of any mm -hmm. type of faith. And I said, well, when was the last time you prayed? He said, I was 14. Well, I knew immediately something happened when he was 14. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I said, what happened? He said, well, my mother was dying of cancer. Uh, so I said, so you prayed and you asked God to heal your mother and she didn't get healed and you became an atheist to get back at God. And he never replied to that. Because it was too mm -hmm. true. It yeah. was too true. That was the end of it. Well, you yeah. know, you, we talked about what the chief thing of evolution, Darwin, that we, we, you know, it seems pretty clear that I mean, when his 10-year-old daughter, what was this, do you remember what her name was? I can never remember her name. Yeah. Uh, Sarah. No, it wasn't Sarah, I can't remember. But anyway, when she died, he became embittered. I mean, his background was not that, not, I mean, people say, oh, he's trained to be a minister, but yeah, but his grandfather was Erasmus Darwin, who was really the precursor of evolution from mm -hmm. shells and everything. That was his logo, you know? Oh. You're, talking about, you're talking about 1810, you know? Mm -hmm. And the idea of the great chain of being and all that kind of stuff was going on. Those are theories that were moving around for a long time. But Darwin, when his daughter died, I think he just got embittered. It pushed him. Ironically, his wife, Wedgwood, right? Isn't that one? Uh, yeah, Emma Wedgwood, Emma Wedgwood, yeah. Wedgwood, yeah. She was a Christian, devout Christian. And I don't know how that ever, I guess they didn't talk religion in the house. I don't know how they got away with well, it. Well, Darwin, as I understand from some of his quotes, correct me if I'm wrong, he never said he was an atheist. He always believed in a deity. Is that, is that correct? I think his son says no. I don't know whether he ever said he was an out mm -hmm. atheist. But it became very clear at the end of his life he was more atheistic than ever. He oh, was really, right. yeah, there was no deathbed confession, I'll tell you okay. that. That's, that's a myth, okay? We know where that comes from. Uh, Lady Hope or something like that. Mm -hmm. He had a deathbed, that never happened, okay? And his son said at the end of his life he was more 
you know, more atheistic than he had a lot of health problems. He had just all kinds of issues in his mm -hmm. life too. And it seems like inside was was the the bitter fruit of that kind of thinking, unfortunately. And you know, look, we we I, we have a friend, uh, Jerry, Doctor Jerry Bergman. He became a, a creation, he became a believer first, but he began to look at everything in the world that we value as good. Has really been developed by Christians. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's hospitals, education for everyone, including the poor. Uh, you know, all these kind of things. Charity war. Uh, this is all Christian. You don't find this in other cultures. Without it, he, he looked at that and he goes, "Boy, this this is a loud fact." You know what? What, what do atheists produce? Mm -hmm. yeah, what yeah, do yeah. they produce that helps the world? They might do a, a scientific, they might have a scientific breakthrough or a creative technology that is useful, that, and that does happen. But they're, but the, a culture that would be an atheist doesn't produce... Hold on, Rich. Yeah. Uh, atheism you know? gave us wonderful things like communism. Oh, yeah. That was a great help. Right. Mm -hmm. that was a real big help. And the, the Pol Pot massacre, atheism gave us that as well. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's kind of like a negative thing. Well, maybe. Yeah, maybe it was negative. I'm talking about positive. Oh, positive, okay. Yeah, something that actually made the humanity a little better place to live, not a, not a worse place mm -hmm. to live, you know? So, anyway. Well, it's interesting. I did, I've done some research on the highest levels of suicide in the world, and they're all in countries that where they've had atheistic communism. Mm -hmm. Lithuania, Ukraine, and Russia, the last I knew of those were the three highest levels of suicide in the world. And all of which were steeped in atheism. It's also one of the lowest birth rates. You know, people where, where yeah. atheism comes in trench. It's like, what's the point? They, they don't even have. They don't, they don't even have legacies to leave on to right. quote memorize them or remember them. They, they, they very low birth rates. The more you go down yeah. that road, you don't you don't care, and uh, it seems to it seems to lose your way in every way. So, so uh, uh, Kirby. Uh, what greeting do you give us from Belgium now that uh, the, the show is almost over? Well, a, a greeting from uh, the, the bridge, Assemblée Chrétienne, my assistant pastor Roger. Uh, we're having a great time there sharing the faith. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we enjoy talking to atheists because they've got no defense. So that's the greeting we have there. We're planning a church there that proclaims the gospel. And I'm hoping to see both of you there in a few weeks or a few months. Yeah. Well, we've talked about it. we're trying to figure out a way to get out there, you know, so it's, I think it's going to happen. I think so. Well, we'll, we'll see you next time on Revolution Against Evolution.